Hi, welcome to Leaving Babylon. I'm Madeline. Uh, the theme of the video today is 1776, the people versus the king. And I want to address this as I've been wondering about it for a long time. And the, the year 1776 is very significant in the context of uh, Revelation 20, many believe that 1776 was sort of a, a loosing of Satan, um, which is demonstrated on the Statue of Liberty by the chains around the feet. The Statue of Liberty itself being a representation of what many would be would believe to be Lucifer, um, although that can take many names, not always Lucifer, but generally speaking, uh, the 1776 uh, year is inscribed on the tablet that uh, the Statue of Liberty is holding as well as July 4th and this indicates that the Declaration of Independence is a significant event uh, in this um, time period of history and everything following it, everything leading up to it and so today I want to speak to that uh, why would they put the the year and the date that specifically on the Statue of Liberty um, and we all know that the Declaration of Independence was signed on the 4th of July 1776 so this means that there is a link between um, the the uh, Western or American uh, concept of Liberty and um, that being a more modern and uh, you know how do we define that so where I'm going with this today, ultimately, I have been uh, presenting in various videos that the the revolutions that led up to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the French Revolution, and other various uh, things that went on in history leading up to this time period were actually uh, spiritual evidence of spiritual rebellion against Jesus Christ, who is the king of the realm, and uh, his, uh, his authority over them. And um, so that's one of the things that we're going to be um, investigating, but also um, really just the understanding that what does it take uh, for Satan to be loosed? And we've covered that in various videos as well. I've talked about, you know, we've gone back and looked at even Victor Hugo's work on uh, called The End of Satan and how the angel, Liberty Angel, went down into the abyss and summoned or awakened Satan. And that would have been around the time as well of the uh, French Revolution and leading up to that. So there are a number of key events that have happened throughout history, but initially um, I just want to um, play a video to kick it off and then we'll go from there. So bear with me just a sec. It is time to trust the people of Gotham with the truth, and it is time for me to resign. And do you accept this man's resignation? And do you accept the resignation of all of these liars, of all the corrupt? These men locked up for eight years in Blackie and denied parole under the Dent Act based on a lie. Gotham needs a hero. He needs it now more than ever. You betrayed everything you stood for. What's the point? For there when the structures fail you. All the robots aren't weapons anymore, are they? Shackles. Letting the bad guy get ahead. One day, you may face such a moment of crisis, and in that moment I hope you have a friend like I did. To plunge their hands into the filth, so that you can keep yours clean. Your hands look plenty filthy to me, Commissioner. We take Gotham from the corrupt! <laughs> of generations who have kept you down with myths of opportunity and we give it back to you the people Gotham is yours none shall interfere do as you please but start by storming Blackgate and freeing the oppressed Take a 
Dann los! And cast out into the cold world that we know and endure. Courts will be convened. So one of the concepts I want to talk about here is who are the people and who is the king and I also want to talk about uh, who are the oppressed and who they consider to be the tyrant. So in, in the wordage and the language that these uh, so-called liberators, the independence leaders, you know, the sons of liberty, these people that were um, causing intentionally these revolts against uh, the authority, which they would say was the old world nobility and also Great Britain, who was imposing taxes on them. And, you know, these were the causes that they gave uh, for the revolts and for the revolutions and, and this need, this desperate need for independence. Let's not talk about ownership of the land. That isn't really spoken about. It's more about this, uh, the moral of uh, the people needing independence because of taxes. And that's the storyline. So in school, we learn these, these uh, stories, you know, these um, fairy tales, I mean, history. And um, that's what they tell us these, uh, these meanings are behind all of these events. However, I think we, we know there's probably an alternative narrative that we should be looking into. And so for starting um, this conversation, I want to start with some scripture. So Acts 26, where Paul is speaking to Agrippa, and he's explaining the purpose of what he's doing and how God has allowed him to be a minister to people. And one of the verses I think feels very applicable today is um, when we speak the truth, it's to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith. That is in me, and I believe that was about Jesus. So, uh, so I, I don't think Paul was talking about himself there. So, um, and then we have, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As, man has, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians six fourteen to 18 Proverbs uh, 1, verse 31 and I just, this is something I remember when we talk about these people who have intentionally deceived the world to the point where they are uh, wielding mass control, mass um, deception, and uh, all of the beguiling that goes along with that in service to their father, the devil. And this verse says, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. And I believe that's very extremely true because the Bible said it. Um, one thing I want to talk about really just to get it off the table is I, when we talk about the loosing of Satan, you know, I think there are some very physical uh, components to that that we could see in terms of, you know, maybe earthquakes and maybe uh, mud floods and there might be, you know, conjecture around those things, which 
very possible, right? But I think there's a component that people often don't want to get into, and it's what I would call the Pandora box. It's kind of that unassuming, kind of boring looking container in the corner that has some difficult concepts. And, you know, I don't think what we're going to talk about today is too difficult, but, you know, to lift the lid on the legalities, the things that actually hold it all together, and whether they be, um, legitimate or illegitimate legalities, these are the components that are actually the nuts and bolts of the great deception and, and these false liberties and these false independence movements that truly um, gained the consent of the governed. And that's one of the uh, components that we're going to talk about. So we have talked in the past about the um, the uh, that sort of consent of, of the governed and where um, you know, if you have the majority that goes along with something, then it's uh, considered to be an accepted, um, and that's what, you know, that's why democracy has also been part and parcel of the independence liberty movements, is that they sell the, the people, or not the people, but like the constituents on the idea that um, if you just count the votes, you know, uh, you're going to get a fair result. What they don't tell you is that they've selected all the choices. So the people that you are actually voting for are people that y you didn't actually choose to be in the running in the first place. So there's there's a sense of democracy that is also a bit of a, a sham, I would say. I'm not, you know, I'm not completely um, degrading it, but I am just saying that I think it's one of the mechanisms that the liberty and independence um, narrative will tell you that you have control through this this kind of mechanism called democracy. What they don't tell you is the the game is rigged um, <laughs> in their favor. And I also want to read Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse twelve through seventeen, that they might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So that's just some encouragement because we need encouragement in these times. We know that um, the enemy has pleasure in unrighteousness, whether they're deceived or not. They're having pleasure in unrighteousness and we must come out from them and be separate. We must choose to be on the only side that matters, which is that of Jesus Christ. Something I want to just draw attention to, I've only put 10 points on this timeline, but I want to give a little overview of what I would consider to be some significant timeline uh, points that maybe led up to the 1776. Uh, and this is not exhaustive at all. There is not enough in this list, but I do want to just give a little bit to work with here. So. 1660, George the First, um, he was born the ruler of Hanover um, in Germany. So we have this German connection, and later also the King of Britain and Ireland. So he he sort of unified all of those nations under his lineage and his uh, royal status. In 1665 was the bubonic plague, which allegedly killed millions of people. So we have a timeline here of things happening that um, for the scale of what we would consider to be kind of very, um, not archaic times, but old fashioned times where the, the infrastructure, you know, according to the historical narrative wasn't very good. So I mean, it's, it's all very um, hard to imagine when you talk about millions of people dying of, of the bubonic plague and things like that. Now, 1666, uh, the number alone is a big uh, hallmark for me that this was a significant date. Um, there was quite a lot said about this date, um, or, or this year, I should say. 
Uh, so in September of that year, the Great Fire of London took place. It was a three to four day complete burning decimation of the city. Um, St. Paul's Cathedral was burned. And I know again in the wars, St. Saint Paul's Cathedral was a target of d demolition. So the bombs that were dropping over London were actually... Um, landing on St. Paul's as well. I don't know how many times it's been rebuilt or recovered, but it has been uh, a target. Isaac Newton allegedly discovered gravity, and as a believer in biblical cosmology, I believe there's other um, explanations for what uh, modern science would call gravity. So that's, uh, that to me is another hallmark of the Great Deception. 1688 American Enlightenment begins and so this false light movement that had been going through Europe uh, was also now prevalent in America. In 1740 I added this as a as a hallmark of something um, it probably needs more investigation but this is 1740 Ireland experiences 21 months of extreme cold weather event. Again this is just a an event that seems to be significant in the timeline, so I wanted to put it in there. 1743, Mayor Amschel Bauer, who was the original Rothschild, was born into a money-changing family, and they were defined by a red hexagram. And, you know, if you know symbology, hexagram is significant uh, for what we would call the Moloch Satan um, presence in that, uh, that picture. Rothschild is, was the original name of the family, um, and they became the Rothschilds. So Bauer was the original family name. 1752, the Gregorian calendar was adopted by Britain, Ireland, and the British Empire, including America and Canada. And I, I think this is really important because uh, the calendar change, it, it was necessary for the satanic agenda to be implemented and why would that be well it's because they're actually hiding dates they're hiding the timeline in which we live and so according to the date that we can put on this it's 1752 but it could be 500 years out um, by our you know what we know we may still be in the thousands at this point in time I've seen a lot of different calculations I've read books and um, I think it's highly likely that the year that we think we're living in 2024 is not the year that it actually is so the Julian calendar was discarded and they at that time introduced this solar year which is a hallmark of the sun worshiping pagan uh, mystery Babylon religion taking over and so 1752 would have been a very significant time um, the, of this progressive loosing of Satan. Uh, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, I believe it was on the day of the All Saints feast. Um, so a church, you know, feast uh, schedule was interrupted by what we call this earthquake. And I think there were hundreds of thousands of people that allegedly died. Um, survivors who tried to escape on the coast were killed by an eight high tidal wave this is in the this is actually what's recorded so and um, they say that that was triggered by the earthquake so again another significant event in the mid 1700s uh, cataclysmic type events 16, 1769 to 1770 mayor Amschel Rothschild so he went from Mayor Amschel Bauer to Mayor Amschel Rothschild draws up the plans for the Illuminati and that is the name that uh, defines the keepers of the light, false light, uh, worshippers of Lucifer and they would be doing their practices in secret under oath. And then eventually 1776, the year that we're going to discuss today, it was Adam Weishaupt who officially organized the Illuminati and kicked it off so this would be the initiation of the illuminati the great fire of the new york city so if you're you're thinking this is the release of satan which i believe highly likely on this year you need to burn down the um the remnants of what would be the representation of the millennial reign of jesus and so that makes sense and then they called new york following that the 
the um, the Big Apple, right? So uh, the Big Apple referring to the Garden of Eden and this big deception that went on in the Garden of Eden to get Adam and Eve to sin by taking of the fruit. And then the signing of the Declaration of Independence also happened that year. So we have um, increasingly uh, sort of like this cascade of events that were maybe cascade isn't the right word, but a building of events that were starting to form um, an eventual outcome. So I want to talk about now the colors of the flags and being that as we um, we all celebrate, uh, and I say we, so in the summer months, the British have the um, trooping of the color, the Americans have the um, Independence Day and France has the Bastille Day and Canada has Canada Day and these all happen June July um, the trooping of the color has already happened this year and that's the British version of what I believe is the same celebration and I believe it is the celebration of the loosing of Satan these three countries in particular France Britain and the United States all have the same colors on their flags um, and so we'll just talk a little bit about what the meaning of that is and here you can see Bastille Day so again it's the red white and blue and the American historically you know this these uh, flag colors and then the Liberty cap so the, the cap itself is red and um, then we have the stars and we have the white and a sword is always present in a lot of these pictures to show that you know these people are, are intent on protecting the freedom that they believe they have won. Uh, here's the British and you can even see the red in the sky here that might be the blue sky above but you've got the white clouds you've got red white and blue here And so I just want to play a quick video to um, kick off some more conversation about this.
So what exactly is the United States of America? Um, I have shared an article before, and this is part of it that we didn't get to last time, but it is full of really interesting information, including um, discussion around um, how the United States is actually a corporation. And so just to read off this page here, the United States uh, Corporation is, um, the employees are called citizens. And so that's what you would consider to be uh, the country, but it's actually a corporation. And that goes for most countries. Canada is the same, probably Australia, New Zealand. Um, all of these countries are corporations. Uh, so we see here that the United States, which actually has U.S. citizens, so people are in the territories, are actually considered citizens of the United States. Everyone else um, would be a citizen of their state. So that's just something to bear in mind as we talk about the USA. Um, you're not a, you know, if you live in the United States, unless you live in one of these territories, you wouldn't be considered a uh, a citizen of the US of A. You'd be considered a citizen of your state and then you'd also be a non-resident alien with respect to the United States. I will link that article into the description of this video. There's another book that has been uh, like an online book. It's called Civil, Civil Liberties and um, the author has done a lot of work to dissect the, uh, the legal status of the United States in relationship to, the, to England, so the ownership of England. And the, the takeaway or the summary of this, and so there's quite a lot to read, but I'll just read the highlights here, is that the United States um, in relationship to Britain, who owned the land that America is and who still owns the land. Um, during the independence movement, uh, the, the result of that movement and the treaties of, that surrounded it, such as the Paris Treaty or the Treaty of Paris, um, recognized the independence of the United States. That's, that's a very important word. To recognize is not to grant independence. So the recognition um, of independence was secured which is kind of meaningless and that's the point of this uh, here again so in 1889 the treaties and conventions uh, department of state wrote um, they had been recognized by the treaties so this independence movement was recognized and when they declared themselves independent to all the rights and powers of sovereign states but they did not derive them from concession of the british king and then the recognition of independence was achieved, not a grant of it. So they didn't grant them independence. So the King of England did not grant it. And then further down, again, under this uh, Department of State Treaties and Conventions of 1889, uh, mere a mere recognition of pre-existing rights as to territory, and no territory was thereby acquired by way of cession from Great Britain. All British grants are invalid, which were made after the Declaration of Independence and purported to give title to land within the territories of the United States as defined by the Treaty of 1783. And then the author of this comments, independence was recognized, not granted. And the powers recognized were the states, not the people. And then we have this uh, actual capitalization of the people. And this goes back to the title of my video, which is uh, who are the people? Where is this defined? I think often when we think of ourselves as being the people in any country that we live in, um, we, could, we think of ourselves as being those people. But actually, uh, the takeaway from this study that was done is that the people who were being empowered were the aristocrats who were setting up the corporation of the United States, not the little people, us, who were um, being governed by the states. So the people in these documents, in these declarations, does not refer to you or me. It refers to the people who had come in to take over, and they were the people that were going to benefit from this uh, declaration and from the Constitution and things like that. So the king knew in 1783, the treaty, uh, that it was not worth the paper it was written on, 
and the land was not his to give away, and after the Declaration of Independence, according to the Secretary of State, all British grants were and are invalid. So where does that leave us in terms of what is the British, what is the British, the French, and the American flag actually mean? And of course, because we're talking about July 4th, 1776, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the, uh, the American version. Um, so we always see this red, white, and blue, the stars, and I think she's also wearing a liberty cap there that might just be folded back. And so this always represents liberty, and the topic of this is the people versus the king. And so uh, when we look at what happened in 1776, we see that the, um, the, what happened was the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And that is uh, what we're going to focus on. So, yes, Canada also has a similar um, time frame that these things happened in, as do other countries. But here we see the Statue of Liberty holding the, uh, the torch up in the sky, the enlightenment of the world, and um, the celebrations for this day are off the chart. Okay, so every town, every city, and it's the same in, in all these other countries, um, goes ballistic, right? So all of these fireworks, like fireworks are a big part of it. And um, I think there is a ritual associated with it. There is, um, there is a, a huge celebration to what I believe is to um, elicit the consent of the governed. So we are the governed and the people who are the aristocrats, who are the ruling bodies, they are the ones that need us to consent to these things and to these rituals. And we're gonna go a little bit more into what is this. And so the video I just showed was um, basically uh, about the stars and about Egypt. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that now. And so have you heard of the star called Sirius? Uh, you may be surprised that there was a dog uh, called Sirius that allegedly was one of the victims on 9-11. And what's interesting about that is Sirius is called the dog star. And so uh, there's also another character called Sirius, Sirius Black from the Harry Potter series. But ultimately this all points to a star and it's actually a binary star system and it's called Sirius. And one night I was actually out walking on a beautiful clear night and it really caught my eye. There was this really flashy, you may have seen it, very, very active star, very clear in the sky and it looked like it was going red white and blue really really fast and I took my phone out and I was videoing it and um, that star goes crazy like it is it is like super intense and and it's so weird because when you're looking at it you're like wow that that looks like it's going to explode it's just like you know it's, it's just going crazy and I think there's a reason for that um, when we start talking about the stars and about their meaning to the people of Mystery Babylon, the people that uh, I would say are the ones who have taken over in this uh, current society in which we live, and I would say it's the little season um, after the millennial reign, which is described in Revelation 20. We have this time period where um, there was a big takeover uh, we see evidence of this in the mud floods. We see evidence of this in the burning cities, um, in the uh, introduction of indoctrination, I mean school, um, education. And um, so all of these ways that we have been uh, penned in, there was the orphan trains, you know, there was like this repopulation of the earth and this uh, establishing of control. And so uh, we can talk about this in terms of Mystery Babylon, uh, but it's an Egyptian concept uh, when we talk about Sirius. And you might say, well, why does this, re you know, how does this refer to the flag or the colors of the flag? Well, Sirius is a very um, important star historically in the Egyptian mythology. And it represents the union, divine union of Isis with um, Horus and 
sorry, Osiris and then Horus. So there's this kind of um, occult connection to that star, which, which actually represents Isis. And, um, and so the stars themselves are actually blue and white. But when there's a conjunction of these um, stars, which I believe there's a star and then a dwarf star that moves around it, and then the sun um, comes into conjunction, it actually turns the white star or white dwarf star red. And this is, this is an occult meaning. It has to do with opening gateways and things like that. And so here we can see, um, and so Sirius A is a bright star, which can be seen in the Western sky with a naked eye, um, but not Sirius B, which is the small dwarf star. And then these Dogon people, which I'm not sure what I believe about that. You know, their name starts with dog and it's the dog star. So not too worried about the Dogon people, but I did find this article and this is not a, from a Christian perspective, but this does describe what they believe. And so you can see the, the pyramids here indicating that this belief system has come to uh, our current day through the beliefs of the Egyptians. And so it says here, in Egypt much revolved around Sirius as the gateway and center of all that is sacred. Goddess Isis has been associated with the star Sirius. Um, and here it says the heliacal rising oops, of Sirius, as it is known, occurs when Sirius rises on the horizon together with the sun and remains visible for a few moments until it fades with the advance of dawn. The Great Pyramid in Egypt is also aligned to the rise of Sirius. Chambers found within the pyramid are strategically positioned in reference and deference to Sirius. And so these mythologies of Isis, Osiris, and Horus in Egypt are based upon the Sirius connection. And so where we take this uh, to the next step is we actually, so we've got the red, white, and blue, which are signified on the in the mystery Babylon religions, but also the Egyptian connection to Isis and Horus and Osiris. And so we get this conjunction that's now happening. And you know, these people believe that, you know, the, the above and the below are connected. And, um, and so they, they put high stake and high value in these celestial events, which happen in what they call the dog days of summer, which are July. Okay. So whether it be July 1st in Canada, July 4th, um, Bastille Day, these are the dog days of summer and the dog star being serious and these conjunctions that are happening, you basically celebrating along with Mystery Babylon in an occult ritual. And um, so I want to just talk about that a little bit. So, and then going back to the, the Statue of Liberty. So the Statue of Isis was first known as Liberty Enlightening the World, but is now more commonly called the Statue of Liberty. Is she enlightening the world or is she actually the goddess who keeps our illumination in the shadows as she holds the light above in her torch only to hide the truth from the profane or the uninitiated? And they're talking about the secret societies. So if you're not in, then you don't know anything. And um, so keeping it from the profane of the abyss, the sea of humanity who are kept in the dark. And a secret that keeps most of the population of the United States in, in complete ignorance as they are cast under the wicked spell of Isis, a goddess of both heaven and hell. And then um, there's a little bit more here. So just something else about this Statue of Liberty is the number 11 is represented in the 11 pointed star that the Statue of Liberty sits on which is called an hendemogram, hendem, hendecagram, <laughs> hendecagram. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. In re it represents this, that word there. This literally means peels, shells, or husks of the tree of knowledge. And so in Jewish Kabbalistic cosmology, the calipot or metaphorical shells surrounding holiness. Anyway, uh, Isis not only holds the light above humanity, but she also is the goddess of duality. So who represents evil or impure spiritual forces? So the 11 pointed star, uh, so this 11 pointed star and the number 11 are the representation of evil or impure spiritual forces in Jewish mysticism. 
Please also note that 11 over 2 star polygon is used as a symbol for the Aleister Crowley Foundation. Okay, and I think that's all I wanted from that, but you can see here, so this kind of um, Isis symbology here. And yeah, so I think we need to understand that this connection to the flag the colors of the flag, not to mention the stars on the flag, are used as a reference to uh, the Sirius um, binary system. And so you can see here that Horus, Osiris, and Isis, uh, so Sirius is down here, and then these other two stars over here represent this kind of triangular shape too. And um, something about the movement of the stars and the constellations um, First of all, God created it all, but because sorcery is such that it will use um, what God created for good and it will do something evil with it. So it will use it to benefit itself. And so Lucifer, uh, being the great deceiver, uses the, the movement of the stars and the knowledge of these stars to actually benefit himself and to also deceive the world. So, you know, that might be bestowing... Um, uh, wealth and you know power on people who are going to help this come to pass and I think that's actually what happens in most of these uh, the stories of these people that come into these positions obviously some people are born into uh, the family bloodlines and they also are kind of initiated from very young ages into believing these things uh, but here you can see the relationship so this is a statue of or a representation of Isis on this side here and the Statue of Liberty and you know the rays coming out of the head and um, just very reminiscent of the old Egyptian mythology as well we know that there you know there is similarity to um, Colossus of Rhodes um, Apollo um, and some of those other uh, like Mithras as well uh, that we see in the Statue of Liberty and and I would just say that I think that tells us that the same entity is behind all of this this is um, the same mystery religion that the occult worship and that ultimately goes back to Lucifer who is the leader of the pack he's the one driving all of this uh, deception and here we can just see clearly in sort of more modern context the order of the eastern star so sometimes the Sirius is actually referred to as the eastern star and um, you know they, they like to put nice wording on here charity truth loving kindness but actually that symbology tells us a totally different story um, it tells us who they worship it tells us what they're involved in in terms of rituals and magic and um, sorcery and these are things that are forbidden for Christians to be involved in so when we talk about the relationship of Sirius to the flags uh, through their color and maybe through the stars that are on the flags we have to go back to that verse that says be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness Okay, so this is a, I think we're coming into a greater understanding through the Holy Spirit, at least I am, and I know many are, is that the, the rituals that we have been born into, the ritualistic mystery Babylon that we've been born into, has taught us to engage with this, right? Um, and so ultimately you end up, without realizing it, deceived into uh, paying homage to Lucifer, Isis and all of these um, sorcery-based um, religions. Something about um, Sirius is that um, it, when you also pledge allegiance, so this is just another aspect. You know, I think a lot of countries, they have an anthem, they have the flag, and then they'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. And so this is oath-taking. You know, this is kind of... Um, initiating everyone into this occult religion and this is something that we can see Alice Bailey writing about you know she talked about how by 2025 the whole world would be initiated into the occult and look how it's happening this is actually all around us it's in everything 
and it's become the foundation of all the events, all the social gatherings, all of the celebrations that as a society, we, we've forgotten the feasts that God gave to his people. We've forgotten all of these um, important times of the year. We've been moved into a solar calendar to celebrate the sun and to worship the sun and to worship all of the celestial bodies. So we live in Mystery Babylon. We have um, Egyptian uh, occult mysticism all around us at all times. And so, you know, we live in the mystery of iniquity, as Second Thessalonians um, said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And uh, we look forward to uh, the completion, I, you know, um, of, of this time period by the uh, destruction of Gog Magog. We go back to the Illuminati. They were designed by uh, the Rothschild family, who are the banking people of the world. They live in London. They're based in London, which is the finance capital of the world, which is also the center of Gog Magog. And so uh, we know that in Revelation 20, uh, God destroys Gog Magog as it surrounds, as it has surrounded the camp of the saints. So I want to go back and talk about uh, who uh, are considered to be the founding fathers of this independence uh, of the United States of America. And we recognize the faces here. And so I want to first talk about George Washington. Um, I haven't talked about him too much before, but we have seen the apotheosis of George Washington in the Washington Monument, which is inside the, um, the building at the top. And uh, so he has been deified. And something I want to show you now, I'm gonna play a little video of a, a screen recording I took when I was going through his uh, lineage. And you'll see why he ends up there in the top of the building as if he is a god. So you'll see here, this is, uh, this is actually a pedigree site. It's a really good one. It doesn't track everyone, but it tracks all the people that have um, positions of you know that we recognize names that we would recognize and what their lineage is so we're following through here George Washington up through his uh, up through his um, pedigree and um, it's quite extensive it's a very interesting read if you ever have time to go through it fabpedigree.com it's run by um, by just a lay person um, but something you'll see here that gets tracked, it's this haplo, uh, haplogroup. Haplogroups are um, kind of a bloodline that would trace back what they would consider to be um, the evolutionary development of a group of people who can be classified um, through their you know, relationship to one another. And you'll see here, these are the kings of Samara, um, these are the Volga River, 4400 BC, and that's in Russia. And here we have um, another group, and there's notes on all of these. So it's it's really kind of interesting how they identify who they are by kind of the region of the world that these groups are associated with. So if you keep going back, you can see chimpanzee there. Um, and then how this all feeds back into and back through what they would consider to be an evolutionary development of this blood group. Um, as a Christian, I do not believe this, uh, but this is how they are working out their kind of uh, blood group. And that, you know, if you ever send your a, a sample of your blood in to one of these websites, they would do a similar kind of breakdown. Um, so this is just, we'll go back and look at the, uh, the connection to all of the people in the, the genealogy. But this is, as you can see here, it goes to Seoul, a population one star. I believe that's the sun. And then it you know, goes back, back, back through all of these so-called galaxies. And, um, and then, you know, it kind of gets a little bit crazy, you know, the chaos oh yeah chaos happened and Big Bang happened and this was created then and they just make a lot of assumptions at this point about how it all happened so magic 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 <laughs> and a void so you know they can't really tell us what um, what went down 
and uh, obviously they want to completely deny God not saying the person who made this but that's how these people such as George Washington and all of the people that have this pedigree associated with them would believe that by virtue of their blood group you know there and that's why we call these bloodlines you know they're very connected to um, this historical um, association with their their bloodline and uh, but here we're gonna follow back through on the uh, the family so when we go back through you'll start to see um, certain names that we'll recognize and as we move up through all of these um, you start to see George the uh, first of Great Britain and um, these connections now across so Churchill Lady Diana um, Louis the 17th of France um, and these people that were actually all related so you know they might want you to believe in these uh, conflicts between the countries but ultimately most of these people are family and family is you know I think a very strong connection here and we have this Duncan Thane priest of duel and then it goes all the way up and I don't know what that priesthood relates to but um, you know I know that they try to mimic Christ in a way uh, by saying you know they have a priestly uh, inheritance as well as a kingly inheritance so we know that Jesus is a priest king like Melchizedek and I know that uh, these people like to claim similar things you know if you look at um, Queen Elizabeth she also was like a priestess and you know they think that they and then she's the head of the Church of England and so they kind of take on these roles as if they are also divine beings you know they're kind of like they're trying to mimic what Jesus who Jesus is but they're doing it in a corrupt occultic way and um, what we see here is we see a lot of the Irish connection and uh, going up through the Scottish uh, bloodlines, the Irish bloodlines. And at the top there again, you'll just see George I and Ferdinand, who I think is the Bavarian or Austrian um, ruler. And so this connection between Britain and Germany and um, you know obviously the very strong Irish connection which I was surprised to see because uh, I never really thought of Ireland as having a very impactful pedigree but obviously I'm not in the know so but uh, what you'll see is actually this now starts to produce interesting results there's the Franks of France um, and then we see Judah so we see a kind of Hebrew component now being associated here so 19th king you know ha david of judah and these people are hailing themselves as being of judah of the the house of judah and you know we pass all the way we continue on with this this bloodline very very strong irish uh, component but we see spain in here and uh, again, George the first is at the top with Ferdinand as, as well. And then we get to this Harimon, second monarch of Ireland. And we see Egypt in there. So we start seeing the, the pharaohs of Egypt. And I have heard that the, the Egyptians actually did end up in Ireland. And so this sort of confirms that hypothesis anyway. And uh, I mean, whoever writes these, I you know I, I've heard that they keep very very strict um, records of these uh, lineages and we see Crete we see Scythia Gothland which would is the Goths and the Scythians and all of these super um, kind of uh, bloodlines here and something I just want to highlight is that now we're getting into the realms of where the Egyptians come into the picture 
and um, you'll see here Pan, the god of flocks, and Faunus, so a fawn, okay? And so we're still following George Washington's bloodline here. We're going through George Washington's bloodline, and you can see now why, um, and as we continue, you'll see why uh, people believe, and he believed, that he was actually of a divine, godlike um, inheritance, because now these half-god, half-goat, Pan, the god of panic, are featured in his bloodline. And when, so when we go to Washington and we see in the Washington Monument the, the apotheosis of George Washington and he's sitting there like a god, you know, I think it's, you know, it's just them telling you this person isn't fully human. We see the Phoenicians um, actually featured here. Tower of Babel, studied at the Tower of Babel. Phoenix of Phoenicia and um, continuing on up and we have more of these uh, increasingly like um, biblical sounding people so there's Japheth now would be a name and Ezra um, and Lamech of the Noah story so the Noah relationship and we have a charmer so this is now somebody who's acquired spinning and weaving skills um, so discovered the art and then it says here possibly a demoness a succubus okay so we're, we're actually identifying demonic beings so, you know, they consider these to be gods and goddesses, but they are actually fallen angels, demons, and, and such. Here we have Japheth, uh, Lamech, so Noah. And then going back through there, we can see the names um, Methuselah, Enoch, and Thoth, the god of wisdom. Again, so we have names of probably... Um, hybrid individuals who were connected to the fallen angels by genetic um, means again here we have the thought the god of wisdom false god <laughs> julius is now julius of rome is actually featuring there um and again george the first of great britain ferdinand and so these bloodlines definitely carry with them uh a claim that they have gone and uh, associate been associated born of this kind of bloodline that gives them a right to rule over uh, the rest of us and just going back further and further you can still see George the first and so these people are family that's something I really want to draw out here is that George Washington is related to George the <laughs> first these people are not uh, what I would consider to be total enemies. I think the strategy of the enemy, the true enemy, has been to align rank and file um, its own people or his own people to carry out an agenda. And that's why these bloodlines have become so key. And you can see Julius of Rome is kind of the remaining first uh human associated with all of this um, in sort of more modern history so you know now we're going back to Enlil god of wind and um, Apsu ocean of sweet water and Anu but I know that um, you know uh, Elohim was in there as the god of the Hebrews So I wanted to just take you through that to understand the 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 buildup that I I believe was taking place to get to the point of 1776. Um, these people were not uh, just randomly uh, surfacing and becoming, you know, um, generals and leaders of their time. They were uh, probably from before they were born, probably, you know, 
a number of steps or people before they were born in their lineage, um, the this the uh, agenda or the conspiracy of the enemy would always have been to put these people in power at a certain time after certain gates of things had happened and uh, waiting on certain celestial events too. And these things are highly important to the occultists. And here's George Washington. And you know, this guy um, lived on uh, or was based on Mount Vernon. So there's always this mountain involved and that indicates as well that there would be some kind of divine godly associate godlike not godly godlike association with this person the other person i want to talk about we've spoken about him before is benjamin franklin now benjamin franklin was um he lived in london prior to the signing of the declaration of independence and uh he was actually a member of what's called the hellfire club and so this tunnel here is one of the tunnels that um, they used in the Hellfire Club. It was a highly secret society that was, um, so here it says the Secret Hellfire Club uh, was an exclusive membership based organization for high society rakes, first founded in London in 1718 by Philip, Philip Duke of Wharton and several of society's elites. Um, and so the Grand Master himself, uh, Wharton, he was a powerful politician, writer, wealthy peer, but he was also a drunkard, a rioter, an infidel, and a rake hell, which meant a man who was habituated to immoral conduct, such as womanizing and wasting his fortune through acts of gambling and debauchery. And uh, so they considered themselves a satirical gentleman's club, although women were also purported to attend and their intention was to shock and ridicule religious beliefs through the act of mock religious ceremonies. They say mock uh, was supposed president of the club being the devil. And I really, you know, they, they sort of shroud all of this in mockery, ridicule, shock. Oh yes, these are the reasons we're doing it. But now we know who these people are. We, we know how they behave. We know that they actually tell us who they are. And it's on us to either believe them or not. And this is where consent of the governed comes in because we actually, um, we're easily fooled. And that's why we're called sheep. I mean, our, in, our implicit trust in people who tell us something is kind of a, it's kind of a human quality that God created us with. We have this um, desire to believe people and to trust that they are not meaning harm and we want to believe um, the best of people. But, you know, truly evil intention people take advantage of that. And so, you know, this kind of, um, the way that they use comedy or, you know, um, shock, uh, even in entertainment to throw us off. But here they're telling us, they the president of the club was the devil. I believe it actually was. Um, there was tunnels like this. These are the tunnels under the Hellfire Club. And and it was here that, so Hellfire Caves of the West, Wickham Caves, uh, extends for 0.25 miles beneath the Church of St. Lawrence and the Dashwood Family Mausoleum. And here's just some more images of what it was like under there. You know, why do you need these? What, what's going on with this? Why do you need to have these little caves with bars on them in there? Um, so I just think, you know, that's very, very sinister. And then what came out in 1998 when they looked under Benjamin Franklin's house in London, they found 1,200 bones from some 10 human bodies. And the excuse is that these bodies were used in the study of human anatomy, right? Yeah. Okay, the other person that was involved in part of the story and the build up to um, this whole uh, independence Illuminati connection with the USA specifically was a man called Thomas Paine who was brought to Europe by Benjamin Franklin and he lived um, with a man named Louis Bonneville. Um, and these people actually were very uh, rigorously building the Illuminati. Um, 
Louis Bonneville actually had written a book um, called The Illuminati Manifesto World Revolution in 1792. Um, but it was his uh, summary of what was needed to, to really um, revolutionize the world. And you know, I think sometimes we think of revolution as being a positive thing. But truly, like the root of revolution is to revolt and to, um, to disagree with the powers that be. And um, they, they kind of have used this um, dumbing down of the population in terms of understanding what these words mean. And they've injected uh, new meanings and new associations with these um, understandings. And then they've led us right down the garden path. <laughs> so just talking a little bit about the consent of the governed and how uh, demonically using rituals, using um, what I would probably call blood sacrifice in their methods of summoning evil into their intentions. So we know the Hellfire Club, we can just... You know, I'll just go ahead and say that the devil was the president of that club. There was body uh, parts found under Benjamin Franklin's home. And, you know, the, I think that just indicates that there was actual um, sacrificial system going along with all of this movement underpinning it in the secret, in the dark, in the caves, where, um, you know, up above the surface they could continue to polish the story and sell it and market it as something that it actually wasn't um, and so the the real crux of the thing and even Jesus says I stand at the door and knock if any man uh, hears me knocking and opens the door and welcomes me and I'll come in and I will sup with him and there is a consent that is needed in order to move forward in the spiritual realm either moving in or being denied access. You know, you can either revoke your, your consent or you can refuse consent or you can consent. Now, whether that happens by way of deception or not, um, it's on you to make sure you understand the rules. And so um, this regarding the Declaration of Independence, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. These ideas that all men are created equal and that government is based on the consent of the governed became the foundation for the U.S. political ideal of popular sovereignty, that the government exists to serve the people who elect representatives to express their will. And now I want to show you from um, Jesus' life what consent of the governed may look like um, and does look like. And this is the choice that we are given individually. Um, this consent of the social contract, for example, where it has to be group consent, um, could be reflected in the story of Saul when the people really wanted a king of their own, like the, the people around them, like the heathen nations around them. And God actually um, allowed them to have a king in Saul and then David and onwards. Uh, but here is another example of the people either choosing or denying their king. And we'll look at that now. <laughs> the two shall be released to you. Jesus of Nazareth, we cannot let this happen. We must do guilty of proclaiming himself king of the Jews. No, he wears a crown. Oh. Get away. Yes. 
Nobody's moved like that. The pilot, you're not going to free Barabbas. An assassin, an enemy of Rome. I wonder who is the real enemy. So we can see that consent of the governed is a concept that is visible in scripture, um, but it's also visible in the historical narrative that we have been told. And um, knowing this, um, you know, Satan beguiled Eve and Adam and told them things that weren't true and told them to disregard uh, the instruction of God. And um, because they did that, they actually, uh, you know, inherited the punishment that God had told them would happen. And, you know, we're born into sin too, but every day we have a choice to choose um, good or evil. We have a choice to choose uh, to obey the Lord or not. And um, knowing this, Satan has continued with this deception, uh, this beguilement of humanity. And he's used people uh, by bestowing... Um, all you know all the power and wealth on them to carry out his agenda and so that's that's what we're seeing here and i do believe that this rule uh consent of the governed is something that's very um critical and key to the story uh they painted a picture that george the third king george the third was the tyrant and often refer to the tyrant uh by that name and um and i you know when you understand that the millennial reign would have happened the uh, little season would have started and these people were foot soldiers in the army of uh the enemy satan the dragon and so they had to create a narrative that they could use to uh elicit the consent of the governed to allow satan to be loosed and so through the um declaration of independence they were actually declaring that they wanted to be separate well separate from what because we know that the united states is a uh, just i don't say just but like the united states is a corporation okay um that the land still belongs to england so what did they actually separate well they actually separated on in terms of taxation which i think was um officially uh granted but um they didn't separate from the king of england officially uh legally and they did not separate from the um the rule of the king so you know and and on that basis there is still taxation to england that carries on and so what was the separation all about well if you listen to thomas jefferson and what he contributed to the the sort of documentation around the Declaration of Independence, it was separation of church and state and selling it very cleverly as being a good thing. When you realize that what they were doing was they were separating the people through a declaration from the Church of England and they wanted the state, which was themselves, the people, to be uh, you know, not obligated to obedience of the, the church. And that is exactly what happened. And there was a number of migrations of people from Europe into America at that time who 
it would seem, and I'm going to do a little more research on this, but it would seem that these people were um, being held in uh, opposition to their own will by the church in Europe. And I, I think there's a connection there that the founding fathers of the United States were creating a uh, geodome, <laughs> a kind of environment for the people that had been kind of held down or chained by the church uh, that was ruling um, in Europe uh, so that they could come to a land where they would not be um, they would not be dictated to by the church and so the spiritual authority over them they were declaring that that was not um, going to happen in America and I think that's what the Declaration of Independence was actually about. I think it was more about separating themselves from the true king, which is Jesus, and his church uh, in Europe, his church, uh, especially the Church of England, that was uh, up to that point um, in charge over the American colonies. So there is a, there's a big component that I think needs to be um, recognized there. The other thing that was happening in the rest of Europe was that Rome was taking over again. So the Church of Rome had been um, corrupted. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church had been corrupted. And um, Napoleon himself was declared King of Rome, and um, which is really interesting when you consider that Paris was actually the center of everything that was going on in terms of the Roman rule. And I have a theory about that as well, but uh, I'll talk about that another time but Paris was actually the center of of what you could consider to be the Roman rule and then George Washington himself being part of these bloodlines was um, initiated as leader of kind of the military in America until things were ready for him to take over as the president we know that the owl is a particularly uh, significant um, symbol of the Illuminati, the um, secret societies that rule the world and are especially um, important to uh, the um, presidential group, uh, the people that by bloodline are selected to be uh, leaders of the, the United States. And that all goes back to this whole Illuminati uh, light bearers um, process and, and selection that they go through. And uh, also represented on the dollar as well as all over the occult is the, the all-seeing eye in this pyramid. And so when we talked about Sirius and we talked about uh, Isis, Osiris, and Horus being making this triangle in the sky... Um, and then between which you get this um, almost like a like a portal opening or a gateway uh, by which they believe that their God brings light. But Jesus told them, ye are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. John eight forty four. We see the celebration of this light-bearing um, worship, the Lucifer worship. Um, so many ceremonies, so many celebrations, so many clapping of hands and pomp and ceremony that goes along um, with the idea that the consent of the governed, you know, you want to um, make it look very official, make everyone clap along, make, you know, make a big show of it because people are easily impressed by this kind of thing and um, and these people continue to do this and um, and then leading revolutions and you know depending on what side you're on you can feel very um, empowered by revolution to continue this Alistair Crowley wrote uh, the book of the law which if we spell it out L-I-B-E-R-A-L -E spells liberal um, and at the bottom there would be 666 uh, I think I'm not sure what that is there but it's you know basically this Egyptian um, the the Horus symbology there uh, all very present and you know this this liberal indoctrination of the world through the occult methods and through this uh, consent of the governed 
And then now we see places like uh, Notre Dame and many other churches over the um, past years being burned. Um, this is not accidental, this is intentional, and this is definitely um, a statement to the takeover, the continued takeover of the realm by these, um, well, they're not actually taking over, but this is what they want uh, themselves to believe, is that they're taking over the realm um, for Lucifer, their god. I just want to really drive home the, the point that consent is an individual choice. And so, you know, we go back through history, whether it be through the Old Testament or probably through times of um, that were hidden in the timeline where people were consenting to demonic entities uh, consorting with them through idolatry. And this is not a new principle. This has been going on since, you know, pretty much the beginning. Um, and so these are the ways we consent and we give our consent through ritualistic, uh, not we, but like some people give their consent to um, spiritual uh, entities and um, control by engaging in sorcery, idolatry, um, you know, worshiping false gods. Judas himself entered into consent with uh, the devil. People consent to um, spiritual activity in their lives through using various techniques such as Ouija boards. And, you know, I don't see any difference between all of that um, and the, the kind of um, formal declaration of separation from the church as these people made themselves the state and uh, declared themselves free of the tyrant, which in, um, in my mind is actually uh, referring to Jesus, the king. And so going back to uh, the scene in Jerusalem where Jesus was being tried uh, by Pilate, the very clear choice that was made at that time was against the king it was against Jesus and it was done by the people in the crowd you know this kind of consent of the government governed and um, you know that that really sort of describes how um, Satan is allowed to uh, express his uh, his kind of control over people when they reject Christ as their king and they, um, they turn to their own uh, fleshly desires and lusts. So in relation to uh, this uh, Statue of Liberty symbolism, I also want to highlight a story, uh, a Greek mythology story uh, related to Prometheus. And I'll just show you what that is about if you don't know yet. Um, the enigmatic Prometheus unveiling the profound symbolism. Prometheus is a well-known figure in Greek mythology recognized as one of the titans and a god of fire. He is often regarded as the supreme deceiver. Um, the story of Prometheus revolves around him defying the gods of Olympus by stealing fire from them and giving it to mankind in the form of technology. Prometheus also played an important role in shaping humanity. Um, Prometheus was a titan known for his intelligence, trickery, and association with fire. According to the ancient tales, he was the creator of mortals taking on the role of master craftsman. Doesn't that just sound like Lucifer? How he would credit himself with something that God actually did. And here they've, you know, they've shown as if this is a, a basic man without any light and uh, Lucifer's, or sorry, not Lucifer, uh, Prometheus is going to come along and, and give him the light of life, which is a total lie. But that's, you know, that's how these sort of stories work. Uh, he played a role in development of human civilization by providing humanity with an invaluable gift of fire. This act forever altered the course of human history as it enabled the early humans to harness the power of fire and develop critical technologies for their survival and growth. Of course. <laughs> 
because um, we know that God gave humanity all that he wanted them to have and that they would have been completely um, satisfied and completely um, happy uh, in their environment. Uh, so this came at a steep price when he went and stole the fire. Prometheus desert, dared to steal fire from the gods to bestow upon humanity. This act of defiance enraged Zeus, the king of the Olympian gods. As a punishment, Prometheus was chained to a rock, and every single day an eagle would eat his liver, which would regenerate overnight, subjecting him to eternal torment. So we have this idea now of Prometheus actually being chained, uh, chained up. And then the story of Prometheus and the gift of fire serves as a powerful symbol, uh, the impact on human progress. This act of rebellion and sacrifice, so there you get this character considering himself to be a, like a hero of the people, um, can be seen as an expression of empathy and defiance against authoritarian power structures. And of course we know that the occultists believe God to be an authoritarian, um, a tyrant. Friedrich Nietzsche, a prominent German philosopher, identified Prometheus as a symbol of revolt against divine authority, which appeals to the human drive for freedom and autonomy. Other philosophers, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, used the myth of Prometheus to comment on human progress, suggesting that the invention of fire had dramatically and irrevocably changed human progress. So I think that uh, that gives us a good picture of who they consider um, to be. And the reason I bring this up is because the Enlightenment period was all about um, this kind of light that they believed they were receiving. And uh, again, we know this is the false light, but Prometheus was released from his chains by Hercules. And Hercules features quite prominently in the liberation movements, especially in France. And so where you see um, the Eiffel Tower, it stands over a location called the Champ du Mars. And on the Champ du Mars is a cave system and um, I'm going to do more investigation into this, but it looks to me as if the cave system was directly linked to uh, the revival of the old gods. And we've seen this in previous videos where the ancient gods of Rome were being revived at the time of the French Revolution. Um, and namely another sort of revival was this uh, supreme being which they had a cult of the supreme being they would hold festivals of the supreme being and they would hold them in this location right where the eiffel tower is now located and the eiffel tower is considered to be you know this magnificent monument um it has to do with radio waves but also light and when they um, celebrate bastille day it is very much around the eiffel tower so the celebration of liberation and independence is being celebrated on this location and on this location during the french revolution um, period uh, there was a massacre and uh, so bloodshed ritual sacrifice and uh, they actually had the liberty tree there and they had statues to apollo and um, they very much celebrated these uh, fallen angel entities these gods of old that were uh, returning and obviously lucifer being the um, the trickster involved in all of this to deceive the whole world was the hand, uh, the puppeteer hand behind all of this. And so this is kind of the entrance to the cave. And if you go to the Eiffel Tower, you can see the remnants of this there. And this is just an older version of what that would have looked like. Um, but when you look at the old uh, images of the festival of, to the Supreme Being, you can see. Now Paris is, is hosting the uh, Olympics this year. 2024 uh, July 2024 and what they've done here is they've actually recreated that old scene of the um, original French Revolution and they have put the Liberty Tree at the top this would be the Champ du Mars before the Eiffel Tower was there and you know they very much ritualize this uh, independence from the authoritarian um, structure that was the old nobility but also the church that represented christ's rule over them and they wanted to live in licentious liberty um, apart from god and worshiping their god lucifer and here's more imagery this is hercules freeing prometheus from his chains 
And here we have Prometheus actually lighting, uh, bringing the light from the Olympus to humanity. And here we have actually in, I think this is in the Ukraine, a depiction of Liberty and Prometheus both holding this flame. And Prometheus is sort of hovering over this uh, body of a human, which is not yet even alive because he hasn't bestowed this light onto him. And just going back to the, um, the United States, so the Statue of Liberty holds this flame as well in recognition and homage to uh, the false light. So I want to play um, just a video to show again from, from the life of Jesus what the, um, the consent looks like in in a real uh, representation here well obviously it's a, a movie representation but it really happened and this is the choice we are given individually to either consent to jesus as our king or not if you're what you say you are if you're the messiah why don't you save yourself <laughs> Leave him alone. Don't you fear God, even when you are dying? We deserve to die. For we are receiving the just punishment for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That story of the thief on the cross is uh, the two thieves on the cross is a wonderful story that God gave to us to um, remind us and to show us what the two options look like. And you know, these people um, would set themselves up as uh, people that we should follow. But we've demonstrated many times that these people are not. Um, Number one, they're not actually who they say they are, uh, really, or who they portray themselves to be, which are very, in you know, intellectual um, people that would uh, that just want to help humanity. But they are actually very uh, driven by the agendas of uh, the false light movement, which calls itself independence and liberty, because it would rather um, serve itself than be subject to the to God and, and Jesus Christ. And what they do is they create a dualistic system. They set the game, they, they set up the playing board and they choose all of the characters. And then they tell you uh, to, uh, to play along, you know, and this is the way that they actually get us to consent to their program. Uh, but none of these people um, are the truth. None of these people are carrying the, fault, the true light, which is Jesus Christ. They reject that and um, they believe and they've been very deceived by uh, the the Luciferian doctrines and so you know they set up the system which gives you these two false choices because they have chosen all the players on the on the board and um, there's really no winning this game um, it's completely rigged and um, but the truth is is that you know we don't have to play this game and and I'm not telling anyone what to do but I I want people to realize that the consent of the governed only works for them when people consent to their game and um, you know the way out and the way off this out of this game is just not to play it to be quite honest with you um, 
like they they put their little pawns on the board and they put their kings and queens on the board and then they tell you that you know if you're very clever you can play along and um and you know you could put possibly win and that's the big that's the big fallacy is there is no winning that game because they are uh they're all on the wrong team <laughs> and so if we play along and we go along with the rituals and we um we continue to be led along by these people um we are actually engaging in uh you know occultic practices and uh, again just back to the verse uh where it says um have no have nothing to do with the works of darkness but rather expose them and uh you know playing along isn't going to get anyone anywhere least of all the kingdom of god so um I just encourage you all to think about that. But going back to the loosing of Satan, um, I think it's it's extremely important to remember that uh, these declarations of defiance and rebellion were directly uh, pointed at Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we do know that the spiritual and the physical are intertwined. We know that uh, God uses his people to carry out his work in this world as does the devil so there's there's always the spiritual and the physical components to this and so the storylines that we are fed to by our consent can either be coming from a source that is um, aligned with jesus christ or it can be coming from a source that is aligned with lucifer and by now we should be able to know the difference i think we we should be able to know uh, by their fruits you will know them and so if something is not bearing fruit or someone is not bearing fruit um, why would you uh, be unequally yoked with that and give your consent and um, play their game why would you do that so uh, going back to the Declaration of Independence I think it was um, ultimately that time where by the people rejecting God and rejecting the church and separating from the system that Jesus Christ has set up through the Declaration of Independence this was essentially the loosing of Satan and um, at least one of the loosings because I think there was probably a loosing process that involved that timeline I showed earlier which would also include the burning of London and the establishing of the financial system there as well as the establishing of the Illuminati um, we talked about the Hellfire Club, we talked about how the forefathers that wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence were very closely aligned with the Illuminati and the goals of the Illuminati, which is driven by Lucifer, and the Hellfire Club had the president, which was the devil, and, um, and so these are the people that have set up the structure, they've set the board game, and they are moving their chess pieces around. Um, as if this uh, this game is going to win in the end, it really won't. So I want to just play one last video, uh, which should uh, finalize um, where I believe we should be uh, positioned in this world, which is to share the love of Jesus Christ, tell the truth, tell the story of the truth, um, because this loosing of Satan by consent of the governed is not going to last very much longer. I don't believe that uh, it will be very much longer before um, the Lord winds things down and um, our King returns uh, to, you know, returns us to Himself in in this physical, you know, um, in a physical way. And um, and so I look forward to that day. I look forward to meeting you all. And I also just want to remember that. In this little season where deception is so strong, the, the, the greatest weapon we have is the Word of God, um, the Spirit of Truth, which speaks um, what God wants us to say. And so never stop speaking the truth and never stop using Scripture to, uh, to, to show people the truth because God will use that to bring people to Himself. People don't even know who Jesus is anymore. They don't know the story. They've just been... Um, told through media what to think about Jesus and so I want to use this next video just to to show that to many people Jesus is a stranger you know still even in his day they didn't know who he was um, but they came to know him because of the the love the compassion um, the way that he actually reached out his hand to to others and he loved others and he loved 
the people that belong to him and I want us to just kind of like um, get on get on the right path with where you know that yoking yoke with the Lord yoke with Jesus don't yoke with this world so do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers and do not partake in the idolatry of this world do not partake in the um, the ritualistic occultism that we have been exposed to and uh, so I'll just play this last video now who is he? You know, you know about him, about him can, can see. You know, you know he was blind. Do you know who that is? Mm -mm, honey, I don't know him. Oh. <laughs> oh, you know, I went to a service last night. Everybody got hungry. The man fed five thousand people and some more. Which, and he was a man out in the water. And the man was walking on the water. He said, "Come on, come to me, come to me." Well, who is it? You know who he is? I don't know. He's a stranger to me. He's not from around these parts. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the strange. So in finishing up this video, I, um, I just want to leave us with the understanding that July 4th, 1776 was a significant event in the loosing of Satan, in the breaking of the chains from the Church of Jesus Christ, and uh, the people uh, declared separation from the King, which was Jesus, and um, the many historical narratives that sort of market what happened on an earthly basis may certainly uh, partly be true, maybe not at all, but what we know is that um, there was an establishment of a people that were essentially declaring themselves uh, rebels from the, the rule of the king. 
and that is that's really the cover story of this video and um, they rejected Jesus Christ and they continue to uh, because their hearts are darkened they do not have the true light which is Jesus and therefore they cannot see past um, what uh, what they want their desires the less of the flesh and um, and that's how they rule this world and they know that by getting our consent they can continue to rule and um, so yeah I guess that's what elections are all about that's what these ritual celebrations are all about um, to get people clapping along all of these events all of these um, award ceremonies and you know formal um, celebrations of their own uh, making and um, we continue to partake and we continue to be unequally yoked when we when we continue to um, engage with that so uh, obviously a very strong challenge here for me um, it's something I'm working on too and I'm not perfect I'm certainly not um, always uh, doing the right thing that I should but I do ask God to show me and show his church uh, the right way of living in accordance with how he wants us to be his people in this world um, and coming away from the idolatry so I thank you for watching and uh, I'll talk to you next time thanks so much